Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies in their diapers, welcome to the Tiberia Show with your host, Tiberius Boy. That's me, Tiberius. Today, we're going to talk about some very awesome stuff. We have a video about finding markers, a book about everything you want to know about hawks, and we have a totally awesome guest. Today we have the one, the only, the amazing Dr. Shirog Shemassin. Shirog helps students get into medical school and top colleges. Parents, you might want to pay attention to this one. Thank you so much for having me, Tiberius. Pleasure to be here. You're welcome. And today we're going to start off with the video game of the week, and this is going to be a mark. And now it's time for the Video Game of the Week. Today's video game is Find the Markers. This game is made by Markers Epic Memers. Because it's on Roblox, you are able to play it on PC, Mac, Xbox, and even your cell phone. And it is free. This is the only game from Markers Epic Memers. So first off, when you start the game, you have a message about how this is a passion project and not to share the locations of the markers since it would ruin the fun for others. This game is inspired by a lot of the find the type games. So, you know that where you have to find stuff. This time you're looking for markers. There are colored tops with white bodies and with a smile on their face. Okay, so they are pretty easy to find as well. Well, I asked my dad to try it, and wow, well, he was annoyed pretty quickly. See, a lot of markers and sparks where you had to get to, to the location, the say do you discovered it. That means, obby time! Well, my dad really did not like the obbies. He died a few times and said this game was kind of dumb. Well, I found a lot more than he did, but it was boring could he passed because he couldn't find any. Well, I give find the markers 6 out of 10 stars because I really liked that there were some puzzles, but they were kind of just okay, and once you solve it, it's not fun to play again. Midstate Fire has been providing top quality fire equipment services for three generations to the Central Florida area. Don't wait for an emergency to repair. Call Midstate Fire today at 407-246-8855. Get your fire extinguishers and emergency lighting for both your home and businesses by visiting www.midstatefire.com. That number again is 407-246-8855. And now it's time for the book of the week, Getting to Know Nature's Children Hawks. Well, this book is written by Meredith Switzer. Let me to the back of the book. In fact, Shirag, would you like to do the honors? Everything you ever wanted to know about hawks. This book describes the physical characteristics, habits, and habitats of hawks. Wow. So this is an app book that's worth 0.5 points or have a point. It is rated for 5th grade and 5th month. This is a great series about everything nature. This is an old book series and it may be hard to find. What is interesting is that they have two books in one. Wow. Well, this is not like my normal books. This is not fiction. Instead, this is more of a resource book. Kind of like a dictionary, but instead it's all about books. No, hawks. If you want to know anything about hawks, then this is the book to read. For those that don't know, hawks have super eyesight and can see their food from very far away. They will notice a single blade of grass move and can zero in on their prey. Now, I will tell you everything. This is a great resource if you want to know that the baby hawks eat their weight in food every day and grow very fast. Well, their father does not get to meet them for two months because he's protecting the area from predators. Well, I give getting to know nature's children hawks 9 out of 10 stars because I really enjoyed everything I want to know about hawks and explained a lot of questions that I didn't even know I had. And I like that they have very sharp and strong feet. They can sleep on a branch without worrying about falling off, and they can use their feet to catch prey to eat. And they have super eyesight. I wish I had that. And now it's time for an interview of an interesting person. Today's cast is going to be so much fun. Today we have the one, the only, the 
amazing Dr. Shirok Shimasu. Thank you again for having me, Tiberius. It's a pleasure to be here. I love the energy you bring. You're welcome. So first off, how are you enjoying being on the show? Enjoying it? I don't think I've ever done a book introduction, let alone one about hawks. So I appreciate that platform as well. I'm enjoying it. Wow. Okay, so you are listed as an expert at helping students get into medical school. How'd you get started in this unique job? Honestly, it was just organic, Tiberius. You know, when I was going through high school, I didn't really have much in the way of college counseling. And so I really had to figure it all out on my own. And when I got to college, I was figuring out how to get into medical school and assisting a lot of students along the way. So back when I was applying to all these programs, there wasn't really, you know, a ton on the internet. So I had to go to bookstores and learn about it and was self-taught with the process. And as I was having my own personal success, with these admissions processes, people started asking me for help and I was helping them and word of mouth spread and I started writing more about it and it sort of snowballed from there. And really it was, again, out of own, my own self-interest in terms of wanting to get into certain places, but out of that organically, we got to where we are today. Wow. So what really is the difference from an Ivy League school and a normal college? Well, the Ivy League... Uh, First of all, there are eight Ivy League schools, I should back up and say. So historically, the reason there's such thing as the Ivy League, essentially, it was an athletic league. The same way there's the Pac-12 or the SEC or the ACC, there was the Ivy League back in the day. So these were the eight schools. Now, of course, all eight of these schools are very old. They're very prestigious um, and they're academically rigorous. And so the term Ivy League, you know, sort of transcended the athletic conference and really you know became synonymous with this group of prestigious schools so that's what the ivy league is um, and then of course because that that word sort of conjures up images of prestigious schools we now have schools that are considered ivy plus like stanford or public ivies like uc berkeley and on and on and it's just really become again like i said synonymous with prestige and opportunity and you know, a springboard for a great career. Okay, so how long have you been helping students get into medical school? I've been assisting students with getting into medical school for over 15 years um, with, you know, schools all across the country, students all over the country, um, and have really just developed a passion for it because, you know, I see my job as assisting, you know, our students with becoming future physicians in America and elsewhere. Wow. So how does this make the world a better place? Well, I think there's a lot of self-discovery that happens as a result of this. So when you're applying to medical school, there are a limited number of seats. And, you know, students really have to dig deep and they have to reflect on what makes them distinct and how they're going to serve the medical community at large. But then also there are a lot of folks, you know, without our support, they might not be able to become physicians and serve their communities. So our job is to help make sure that they're getting into medical school so that they can pay it forward and serve other people down the line. So I truly believe that the work that we do really touches a lot more people on the other side after our students have become educated, they become physicians, and they're helping the medical world. Okay. Now, I'm in fifth grade. When should students be looking into college, and what may they want to do in their future? I think it's important to start thinking about college early, not necessarily earmarking the specific schools you might want to attend, but being super thoughtful about your higher education and building the right work habits so you can be successful down the line. I think when you get to the stage of high school, when you're in the latter half of eighth grade, it'll be really valuable to start thinking about what you're looking for in terms of your education, your career, what are some extra curriculars you might want to participate in and so on. Because you don't want to get to 11th grade and then it be too late and you not have a sufficient extracurricular profile to be successful. So I think right now, focusing on developing the strong work habits that will follow you through not only high school, but through college and your career is going to be of paramount importance because we want to make sure that you're ultra successful down the line. Okay. So a lot of teens listen to the show, but some may not know if they want to go to medical school, but yet they do want to go to college. Can you help them as well? Absolutely. So we assist students not only who are interested in becoming physicians, but also who are interested in becoming, you know, engineers or lawyers or whatever the case might be. And we specialize really in assisting people with those professional schools. And it's OK if you don't know that you want to be a physician, you know, at age 10, at age 13, 15, etc. But if there, these are some things that you've considered, it's important to explore. 
you know, I'm a big believer in that learning what you don't like is just as important as learning what you do like, because it's going to allow you to filter things out over time and really niche down and specialize in the area that you really only appreciate. Heck, I wouldn't have known that I love doing admissions work had I not help people. But if I just sit and ponder about, hey, I might want to do X or Y or Z, uh, but then not really put my you know, foot forward and, and try it out, how am I going to know? And so it's great to keep things in mind. And as you develop certain interests, explore them and see if it's actually right for you. But absolutely, we assist students who are looking for things outside of medicine. Oh, that makes sense. Well, do you have to have good grades to go to medical school? But what if they are just Bs? So it's extremely important to have good grades in order to get into medical school. You know, if you have all Bs, your GPA is going to be on the lower side and you're not going to be super competitive, for, especially for MD programs. So there are two types of doctors. There are MD physicians and there are DO physicians. These are just different medical degrees. Now, it's okay if you have a few Bs and you can overcome those with, you know, great academic performance. Otherwise, a great score on the MCAT, which is sort of a standardized test for medical school admissions, making sure you have great recommendation letters and all this kind of stuff. So it's okay if you get one B, two Bs, a few Bs here and there, not the end of the world. But we do want to make sure that you're maintaining a pretty high level of performance throughout. Well, some say I have to help charities and do sports to get into college. Is that true? Not necessarily. Um, you can develop what's known as a spike in any area. So sports are one area. If you're a really strong athlete and you're going to use that to get into top colleges, great. If you have a heart for service, that's great. You know, that can be your spike as well. And when we talk about spike, we mean, let's say we have, you know, a certain extracurricular baseline, but one area is stronger than others. It's a spike in your experiences. So sports or service can be, your spike, but they don't have to be. It could be in research. It can be through media arts, like you've become uh, an expert at. And so really just playing to your strengths is going to be valuable, but making sure that you go deep enough where when someone reviews your application, they say, boy, that, that Tiberius uh, fellow, he's, he's really strong in this area. He's clearly distinct from the rest of the pack. And having that level of distinctiveness is going to be hugely valuable to you. Okay. So if one of the parents of my listeners want their child to go to college, how much does it cost to use your program? It really depends on what you sign up for. So we assist students with all aspects of the admissions process. So, you know, for years of pre-application advising, it's a few thousand dollars per year. Of course, when it gets up to the application stages, it increases from there. But a lot of our students actually sign up for a bundle that provides assistance through all four years, and then they get a bundle adjustment that way. But we also have a ton of resources on our website for students who are just curious and gathering more information who might not want one-on-one -on -one support. So however we can support families, we'd love to do it. Okay. So what is the best part about helping students get into a good college? Celebrating their acceptances. No question. You know, coming in Tiberius, a lot of folks are really anxious about where they're going to go to school, what their careers are going to be like, and so on. And, you know, just seeing them come in with cold feet and anxiety and then talking to them on the other side when they're in and having celebratory calls with them and their parents makes it all worth it. I love that process. Mm -hmm. So what is the one thing that when you started to work in this field that you did not expect? Just the level of relationship required to serve somebody well. I think that when it comes to applications, a lot of times students feel like all that matters is the technical know-how. What are my essays going to be about? What are my edits going to look like? The interview coaching you provide. But such a big part of it is that emotional investment that students put in and the anxiety they have. So I see our support not only as making sure to tackle the technical to-dos, but also making sure that we're putting our students in position where they're feeling comfortable and they're feeling you know, reassured through the process and they have someone who's a mentor walking them through every step of the way. And really sort of honing in on that and making sure we focus on assisting our students holistically has been of tremendous value to everybody involved. Mm. Now, now, it says that you help students with disabilities as well. Does it require a lot of more work for a student with dis disability than with the student that does not? Well, it really depends on what the disability is. And I'm glad you bring this up because it's something that, you know, we don't openly talk about all the time. And, you know, because, you know, there are going to be some students who I'm going to make a personal admission here. So I've had Tourette syndrome for a long, long time for, for most of my life. And so I've struggled with, you know, having facial and vocal tics. And, you know, this is something where when I was going through the college admissions process and beyond, I would talk a lot about my experience and how it's shaped me. 
But for, for that standpoint, it was just about making sure that we're communicating how it impacted my life, sort of the challenges and sort of what it taught me along the way. And so it was more a matter of writing about it effectively in an essay. There are other people who have different issues. Maybe they have a visual impairment or a motor impairment. And so obviously we have to accommodate those and make sure that we're assisting our students with putting forth the best application. So bottom line, the word disability is a giant umbrella and it really depends on what that person's specific issue is. Okay. What's the hardest part about helping students get into college or medical school? Just making sure that they're really believing in themselves. I think that, you know, when we read numbers, like the data around how hard it is to get into certain prestigious schools, there are some pretty scary statistics out there, Tiberius. You know, like this past cycle, for example, for college, Harvard only admitted 3.19% of students. And so I think that, you know, it's exceptionally difficult, but it is doable when you have the right strategy. And so our job is to make sure to help our students, not only with the technical stuff, but also to believe that they can, in fact, produce excellent work that is good enough for those schools. Um, because if you don't believe that something is possible, you're not going to start. In the same way, if you didn't think that starting a podcast and having it reach people was possible, you would have never done it, or at least you wouldn't have put your best foot forward. And you're really internalizing that it's possible even if there's a sliver of hope in there, I think will really drive you to, you know, to achieve your best results. Mm -hmm. Well, what advice would you give to my listeners if they wanted to grow up and work in this field? Take it one day at a time. Explore your interests. You know, I think that a lot of students and their parents, unfortunately, will sort of wait around Tiberius until their passion hits them. But it doesn't quite work that way. You know, when we develop an interest, it's not like, all of a sudden, a light bulb goes off in our head and we know that we want to start a podcast or we know we want to work in this field or that field. It's usually something that grows like a flame that grows inside of us. And we have to cultivate it by trying it out, seeing if we actually like it. So if there's a hunch that one has, follow that hunch. Don't wait until one day you wake up and you're like, oh, my gosh, now I know what I'm going to devote my life to. If there's a seedling of interest, follow it and it can blossom over time. What is the one tool that you use most in doing your job? Email. Send a lot of emails. Uh, pretty simple, uh, pretty Spartan, but it works. You know, it's really effective for me to be able to communicate people, you know, in a way that's really efficient because our students are, like I said, they, they need a lot of guidance and information and they need it fast. And, you know, given the realities of life, it's not always schedules don't always align for a call and all that kind of stuff. So I'm a big proponent of making sure that there are email communications with records we can refer to. I use a lot of voice memo software in case there's someone someone who asks a question that has a lot of nuance. I might record something for them and send it off in addition to using email. So just that personal touch really helps. Well, what do you think would make your job easier? Boy, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's a, you know, our job, it's inherently tough because it's very person to person. You can't make it too formulaic. You can't make it too standardized. I have been thinking about getting dictation software because like I said, I write a lot of emails. So if there, you know, I've heard of, you know, different softwares where I can speak and it'll sort of type it out for me. Uh, that's something that I've been looking into. Okay. So you said earlier that you have something called Tourette syndrome. Can you tell my listeners what that means? Yeah. It's the presence of motor and vocal tics for a certain period of time. Now, you don't have to have both motor and vocal tics all the time, so long as each category of tics was present at some point. And so for me, you know, sometimes I'll make a facial grimace like, like uh, you know, like the faces I'm making right now, or I might shrug my shoulders or do sort of a, a wrist tightening kind of thing. So it's, a, it's essentially an involuntary or semi-voluntary stereotyped and repetitive behavior. A lot of times in the media is portrayed as people who have like uncontrollable, you know, yelling outbursts or they might speak a curse word or something like that but those are actually pretty rare instances in most cases it's much more you know mild or moderate like you know what you're seeing here like for instance i might like lift my chin like that or i might make a face like this and so that's what tourette syndrome is it's the presence of motor and vocal tics that's been going on for a while okay well from what i heard people with tourettes can make noises and twitches and can say bad words a lot i'm not allowed to use bad words so do you ever get in trouble for saying bad words so the the actual symptom that you're describing is very rare 
So it's, it's very rare for somebody with Tourette's syndrome to have a tick that involves curse words. Obviously, that's the most like eye popping kind of symptom that you might see in someone. So I think it's become very popularized, but it's very rare for someone to actually struggle with that. It was funny one time, you know, my my wife and I were at the grocery store and, you know, I was having some ticks and the guy asked, are you OK at the cash register? And I said, oh, I just have Tourette's syndrome. And he said, whoa, don't curse at me now. And my wife was pretty upset about it. And, you know, she hadn't seen someone sort of giving that kind of direct feedback. And, you know, I and I talked to her after I said, you know, I've been dealing with this my whole life and people's reactions to me, but it's really an opportunity to educate people. And it's something that I take very seriously. Yeah. So do you know why this disability uses bad words instead of, say, other words like fudge or ship? So that we don't know. Um, you know, as far as I know, there is no research indicating why some people make certain noises versus why some other people have curse words. Uh, but but perhaps people will figure it out down the line. As far as I know, there is no explanation as to why someone curses versus someone does not. Well, are there Tourette's in our other language where people say bad words in their own language? I would imagine that's the case. For instance, if I, I don't know, if I'm in the Middle East and I speak only Arabic and I have Tourette's syndrome and I have coprolalia, which is the symptom you're describing, I suppose there could be cases of curse words in, in Arabic or Japanese or any other language. Cool. So how has Tourette's syndrome shaped or changed the way you approach your work? I think it's really allowed me to reflect and dig deep about the you know quality of work that I do. There were a lot of times, Tiberius, when growing up, you know, peers or teachers would say stuff like "you're never going to make it" or um, you know would give me pretty nasty labels and things like that. And I think that a lot of us will internalize that and wonder, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not cut out for this career or that thing or another. And I decided earlier on that I'm not going to buy into that story. You know, I think that I'm just as capable as anybody else. And, you know, by internalizing my strengths and figuring out that I'm just as capable as anybody else, it's going to put me in a position to be super successful in what I do. Mm -hmm. So when you were a kid, what did you want to do when you grew up? Did you always know that you're going to be helping people get into schools? No, I don't think that there are any kids growing up who think they're going to be an admissions consultant to help get into other schools. I've actually never come across someone who wants to do that as a career. No, when I was a really little kid, I thought I would be an NBA player because I love basketball. Go Lakers. And, you know, when I realized at some point I probably wouldn't be in the NBA, you know, I want to be a physician. I want to be a doctor and help people. Hmm. Now, when I was in college, I was pre-med the whole time and had done very well at Cornell. But I realized at some point that, you know what, I'm actually more interested in mental health. Again, not only because of my own uh, you know, experiences with Tourette's syndrome, but also because I was doing a lot of mental health research. So I actually ended up pivoting and getting my PhD in clinical psychology. So I ended up not becoming a physician. I became a psychologist by training instead. But because I was helping a lot of people get into medical school, and then, you know, there was more interest and word of mouth along the way, and I was growing my love for it, it ended up being a natural fit. Hmm. What was the craziest thing that has happened while doing your passion? A single crazy thing doesn't necessarily stand out. I, I mean, I, I recall, you know, being on television outlets or being asked to speak at, you know, prestigious schools like Harvard or Yale. I mean, those have been some really wonderful achievements and pieces of recognition. But as far as crazy, it's all about, you know, making sure that we help our students outperform, you know, even what they have on paper. So nothing sticks out to me as far as, oh, my gosh, could you believe that happened? Uh, but it's something that I'm, I continue to be surprised every single day by the wonderful people that I meet. Well, I wrote a radio show and podcast that talks about God during my Lion Strong segment. How do you include God's message in your work? How do I include God's message in my work? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a practicing Christian, Tiberius. And, you know, I think that it's always valuable to put others first. You know, I think that with when it comes to the medical school admissions process or the college admissions process, like I said, there's a lot of tension, right? Because students are going to feel really anxious. They might, um, you know, sometimes let that get the best of them. And I think it's really important to make sure that I hold that for other people, you know, and make sure that I'm putting them first, because even if they're having a really tough time, whether it's convenient or not convenient for me to assist them, I think it's important for me to say, OK, you know what? I'm called to serve this person 
in a way that's going to help them put their best foot forward throughout their education and their career. So if I could be that person, and I believe that, you know, I've been blessed with that school to hold other people or to be blessed with that skill, I should say, in holding other people's anxieties and making sure to continue to encourage them. I really feel that's my calling in this work. Okay. What was the first job you ever had? The first job I ever had was working at an ice cream store at the Burbank Mall in Burbank, California. Wow. Well, was there anything you learned from that job that helped you to be a better admissions expert? Customer service. You know, I, I really like getting to know people. Um, that's one of my biggest joys in life. And, you know, with, with an ice cream store, there's a very limited opportunity. You know, you're just asking them what they'd like to order and, you know, you want to make sure that you get them the right ice cream and, you know, give them their change and all this good stuff uh, when people would use credit cards far less back in the day. And so you only had a limited opportunity to actually get to know somebody. And I learned that, OK, is there something unique about them, their flavor choice, their clothing, uh, maybe a language they're speaking as a family that I can get used to get to learn more about them? I think that would be my biggest takeaway from that job. OK, well, what was the biggest mistake you ever made and how did it change as a person? At the ice cream store or in general? In general. Probably not hiring support soon enough. You know, back in the day when, you know, I back in the day, I was the only person who worked at Shemasen Consulting, right? I would do all of the essay editing myself. I would do all of my bookkeeping. I would do everything myself. And I really realized over time that I'm not using my time and my skill set in the best way. And there are other folks who can do some of the areas of my job even better than I can and more efficiently. And I can focus on what I'm uniquely good at. So I think not realizing that I should hire folks sooner. That's probably my biggest weakness or biggest mistake that I made in my work. Well, when you're not working, what do you do for fun? I love food. I love to eat. I love Same to here. cook. Yeah, I love to read about food. I like to travel for food. I'm a big food guy. Um, I also love spending time with my son. He's three and a half. I love my wife spending time with her. Yeah, we've got a second son on the way, Tiberius. Wish me luck. I don't know how I'm going to do two, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to meeting the little guy. Perfect. Well, do you play video games? And if you do, what's your favorite one? I do play video games. Admittedly, I don't have the time that I used to. When I was a kid, I used to play all the time. Um, the game that I played through most recently was Metroid Dread on Nintendo Switch. And I absolutely loved it because I used to play Super Metroid when I was a little kid on Super Nintendo. So this was just like the, you know, the 2021 version of it. Um, you know, way better graphics and all that kind of stuff. Um, gameplay was terrific. Wow. So what's your favorite book to read? What's my favorite book? Well, growing up, it was uh, Alice in Wonderland was my favorite book. And I haven't read it in, in many, many years. Um, I actually, you know, it's hard for me to find time to, to do a lot of book reading these days. But I do read a lot of magazines. So I like reading about like, uh, you know, like Bon Appetit magazine or Food and Wine I like to read about. Or travel magazines like Condé Nast or my local uh, magazine for San Diego Mag. And so these are the kinds of things. When I have, okay. you know, maybe a half hour window in there, that's how I like to read. Okay. 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 Now, can you tell me that one story? You know, remember, it's a kid show. But that one story, hmm, well, that you're not supposed to tell me about. Come on, you can tell me. That I'm not supposed to tell you about. Nope. Oh, boy, you're putting me on the hot seat. And it's a yep. kid's show. Well, oh, I've got a good one. Well, I was traveling to Colombia years ago, and I was meeting a friend. And this friend in Colombia was a very remote part of the country of Colombia. And, you know, I was about to get into a tropical rainforest kind of trip. And he was supposed to join me. And it turns out that he was at a soccer tournament in Brazil. And so he was like, hey, you know, I thought I would be there and, you know, go with you on this tropical, you know, on this rainforest adventure, wow. but I'm not going to make it. Don't worry, my friend whom you've never met, he'll take care of you. And, you know, I just took a leap of faith and got on a boat and went to some remote sort of jungle islands in Colombia. And, wow. you know, when I got back, my wife, my fiance at the time was like, are you nuts? Like, why did you do that? You know, blindly, you've never met these people. And I was like, I don't know, but it seemed like a good adventure. I trust my friend. Looking back, it was probably... You know, looking back, it was probably a weird decision to make, but hey, I made it and, you know, survived in one piece. Cool. Well, is there anything else you'd like my listeners to know about you? 
about me. I'm a huge sports guy. I love basketball, like I said earlier. I love the Lakers. Basketball. I love tennis. Yeah, I like football. I'm a, I'm a big sports guy. So oh, sports, food, travel. Uh, I'm a big Denver Broncos fan. I think you're asking me my favorite ah. football team. So, I, yeah, I mean, I think that captures some of my biggest hobbies. Well, do you like soccer? I do like soccer. I'm a big Germany national team fan, and I love Bayern ah. Munich. I know they're playing right now for the Champions League. Last I looked, they were down 1-0, so I'm kind of nervous about that, but we'll find out how it turns out. Okay. Well, do you have a Facebook for my listeners about to follow you? I do. I mean, we have a Shemassian Academic Consulting page. Uh, I'm not super active on it. So if people want to get in touch, I encourage them to go to our website, shemassianconsulting.com. And that's where they can, you know, get in touch with me. There's a contact link in the top right corner. Okay. Well, what's the one question that you think I forgot to ask you? I mean, I think you did a really nice job. You jumped all over as far as hobbies and, you know, the role of God in my life. And um, I thought it was a really rich question. You know, sometimes I've been asked, you know, what's one takeaway that I want people to have is, you know, I like people to wonder what if a little bit more. You know, I think that in our world these days, a lot of us question ourselves and downplay our odds of success because we're nervous about something. But I always want people to ask, well, what if it did work out? What if there was a chance? And just try it out and see what happens. Okay. Well, thank you, Shirak, for being my special guest. Can you stick around for Math Corners? Absolutely. Let's do it. Yes. See, David Smith, law.com. You can call him at 407-801-2667. Wait, you are not Chuck. My dad can help when people get hurt. He loves to help people. If you are ever injured at work or in a car accident, you should call my friend Chuck. You can call him at 407-801-2667. That website again is cwsmithwall.com. Offices, Orlando. Does it actually have that much W's? <laughs> <laughs> Rock for helping me with math corners. This week we're going to talk about two step inequality word problems. So, you know, my dad is going to love finding me another word problem to solve. Okay, here we go. Katie wants to collect over 100 seashells. She already has 34 seashells in her collection. Each day she finds 12 more seashells on the beach. Katie can use fractions of days to find seashells. Okay, this is going to be a hard one. So, first, you have the goal of over 100 seashells. So you know it's going to be, be need to be more. So you use a greater than sign. Then you have, she has already collected 34. So that means she has 66 more to go. Because you subtract 34 from 100. So that means 66. And if it takes a day to find 12 seashells, then you divide that by 12 and get 5 and a half. So that means 5 and a half days. So, you could say that Katie would need to spend more than five and a half days to complete her quest. So, now that you can graph on a number line pretty easily. Well, this will require an open circle on the 5.5 mark and then draw an arrow to the right for larger numbers. So, Chirag, do you know all about solving two-step inequality word problems? I was able to solve that one myself while you were saying it. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, Tiberius. You know, it was a long time since I took college calculus, which was my last math class, but also stats in grad school. But if you've got one, let me know. But the one you said, I was able to solve while I was following along. Nice. I, I still got it. Well, my teacher says that I would use math every day. Do you use math in your job? I do, uh, but more so for basic bookkeeping types of things, making sure that our, you know, our organization's books, um, you know, are all set and that we're tracking you know, when uh, certain payments are going to come in and making sure that we have enough bandwidth to support our students. And um, so it's not, uh, it's certainly not, you know, complicated calculus types of things, but yes. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much, Chirag, for your help with Math Corners. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. The Tiberia Show would like to thank one of their dedicated sponsors, Custom Designs Orlando. The 
These guys are on Mills Avenue and do all sorts of stuff, ranging from photo ID badges, engraved signs, custom braille ADA signs, vinyl lettering to trophies and awards. The cool part about custom designs is they can ship products all over the United States. You can reach them at 407-898-0373 and tell them that Tiberius sent you. And now it's time for the heart of a line. As you know, we talk about the qualities of living by the heart of a lion, which stands for leadership, integrity, obedience, and nobility. This week, we're going to talk about nobility. For me, I think nobility is remembering we are God's special possessions and acting in a noble way, showing courage and honor. Well, the qualities of nobility are goodness, virtue, honor, generosity, and selflessness. So last, I got a Lion Strong Award for Nobility. So we were at chapel and there was a project that required five people. Six people got on stage and I was the last person to, on the stage. But the teacher let the first person go back to seat. After the project, all five people got a piece of candy for their participation. I decided to give the candy to the girl that was sent back because I thought she deserved it because she was first and I was last. I did not know, but the teacher saw it and submitted me for a Nobility Award. Congratulations. Thank you. So, Shavak, did you see or use nobility at all this week? I think so. I mean, I've seen people on our team, you know, demonstrate a ton of character and, you know, putting others first, you know, as far as making sure to step in when somebody out was somebody was out sick. That happened this week. And I was really proud of people for, you know, just Stepping assisting in. their team member and demonstrating their character and their commitment to our team at large. And so I see it all the time. I'm very blessed to work with people who really care about one another and about our students. So, yes, absolutely. I saw a lot of nobility this week. Thank you. Well, of all of the Heart of a Lion virtues, which is your favorite? Which is my favorite? I mean, I kind of actually like, uh, you know, nobility, but also generosity is a big thing for me. Making sure to, to give my time and to give my, you know, resources and my, you know, attention to folks, um, even if it's, you know, at, at a cost to me. Um, that's something that I, I like to do for other people. Okay. Well, we should always try and be lion strong in everything we do, shouldn't we? Amen. And that's our show, folks. I want to thank the one, the only, the amazing Dr. Shirak Shimasin. Thank you again for having me. I've never been on a show like this, Tiberius. Like I said, the energy you bring, the questions you ask, super thoughtful job. It has been so much to tell you today. I think we learned a lot about how we need to get ready for college and beyond. I'm glad it was valuable. Again, if there's any way I can assist folks, it would be a pleasure. You're welcome. And also, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at The Tiberius Show. And please be sure to visit The Tiberius Show on YouTube and like and subscribe. Also, be sure to listen to us next week on The Tiberius Show with your host, Tiberius!